Okay. So here's, I'm going to give you quick instructions on how to do a, a graph if you have not done so already. What I would like to help facilitate this, what I would like somebody to do is to um, put theirs up on the screen. The, uh, if, you, if you've got it in, um, I told you guys to do Google Sheets, right? It, it doesn't matter. But if most people use Google Sheets. So if somebody's got their data in Google Sheets, please put a screen share up on the floor. Nick, you got it? Oh, I got it. Okay. Now, the reason why I'm having you do this is because we need this, and we need to have the graph be, to be able to interpret what we're doing. I'm going to assume that some people did the same thing that Nick did here. Um, <coughs> can you rotate it, please? Is rotation lock on? Okay. So. We're going to have an issue if you have put units in these. Okay? So to help to correct that, go to the three dots, find and replace. You're going to find M and then capital L. Search. 62 matches. Replace. All. Oh wait. Uh, replace. Go to replace. I oh, you did. Okay. Yeah. Now, the reason why is because the, the a spreadsheet needs if it's going to plot numbers, they cannot have text in them. Okay. Now, <laughs> tap A. Now, so doing that highlights the entire column. Um, and actually, I'm going to back up. Delete those two rows. Or delete those two. Clear slot. Now, tap the A. And the reason again is because we can't have text in our, in our stuff. Now, grab the little blue dot and drag it over one. Now you have both columns selected, okay? Plus sign, chart. We need to change the chart, chart type because they automatically do line charts. And we need to go to this here. All right, hold on, something's wrong. It's the scatter. XY scatter, this one down here. This is the first time I've seen it down here. So what you're looking for is a scatter. Hit the check mark, and now that'll put it on your sheet, okay? You can move it around to different locations. Now, Tap on it to select it, and we need to edit it. Now we need to edit. Go back. Just hide those colors. 
Can you select that? All right, we're going to have to do the best we can with it. Close that out. Okay, so what I was looking for, and I don't want to spend a lot of time doing this, okay? Because I want to focus on the content versus making sure graph making. Connor? Can you restate the steps as to how you got the graph? No. <laughs> Highlight your two columns, make sure there's no letters in there. So tap, so you're going to tap A. There's going to be a little button that here, tap A there, Nick. Tap that A. That blue dot, you drag over, select those two columns, and then this plus button, and you change the chart to a scatter. Okay, now, if we look at this data, we can see here that there's several different things that are going on. We're going to come back to this. Nick, do me a favor on this here. Uh, tap on the, now can you resize that by drip? Can you make it taller? Okay. That helps a little bit. Can we make it a little bit wider too? All right. Now, I want to give some content. We'll come back to this here in a second, or in a couple minutes. But one of the things we're going to be looking for is data in this area here. It's why I had you guys going by 0.2 mil or 0.2 milliliters. And we need data from this area here. Okay. As long as you have a graph that looks like that, you have something that we can work with relatively easily. Any questions so far? Okay. <clears throat> now, thank you, Nick. I put two documents in Drive. Uh, one is titled Titrations um, Graphic Representation, and then Titration <coughs> Calculations. <coughs> now, because we've already gone through the, the, the calculations for the most part. I'm, I want to focus on the uh, graphical representation. So, on this, I have a graph of a strong acid, strong base titration, where I have the strong acid, I'm starting with the strong acid, and we're adding strong base to it. <coughs> and hopefully you'll notice here that your that this data, this graph, looks very different than what yours does. Yours is going to look much more like this. And the pH of this is probably around pH probably around 10. Now, one of the things that they love on the AP exam is to ask you questions about the particulate level representation, meaning at the molecular scale, what's happening inside of this beaker. Now, because we have a strong acid, so at this point right here, before we have added any strong base, we have a solution that is, and I'm not showing water molecules, okay? In fact, on the AP exam, on my test, you'd probably say, don't represent water molecules. 
they're everywhere to begin with. What we're focused on is what the things are that are changing, reacting, that are coming from our acids and bases. So in this beaker, we have a solution that is primarily hydronium ions and chloride ions. Why? Because it's a strong acid. If this is HCl, okay, if this is HCl, if I have a solution of hydrochloric acid, that acid will have dissociated 100%. <coughs> Question so far. As we add strong base, the reaction that's going to take place is relatively straightforward. If I'm doing a net ionic equation for that, I've got the hydronium ion from the acid, and I've got the hydroxide ion from the base producing what? Water. Producing water. Two of them. Now, if I go through and show everything, I'm going to have HCl, sodium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide. That's going to give me sodium chloride and water. These are two different equations that describe the same thing. Now, in our net ionic equation, we were getting rid of the chloride, we were getting rid of the sodium, and we've got our sodium chloride that cancels out. But on the product side here, we have sodium ions and we still have chloride ions. The sodium ions are coming in because we have are adding our sodium hydroxide. So in this beaker here, now we've got sodium ions, we got chloride ions, we got hydronium ions. What don't we have that we added? Now hydrogen, somebody said it back, OH. OH, we don't have hydroxides. Why don't we have hydroxides? They react with the hydronium to become water. Remember, this is a strong acid, strong base titration. Now, so where are the sodiums coming from? They're coming from the sodium hydroxide. Nick? So say you were like you were supposed to put the H2O, but I said you did H's and OH's. Does that be basically the same thing as H2O? Yes. It's just you did. Now, if we count up here, the number of sodiums and the number of hydroniums should be equal because what I have done here is I've represented the volume at what we would call the half equivalence point. Yes. So at this point right here, at about nine milliliters, actually eight and a half milliliters, that's the half equivalence point. Now, with a strong acid, strong base reaction, If we're at the half equivalence point, we still have an excess of the strong acid. This is why the pH is still really, really low. Even though we've added a strong base, we still primarily have the acid in our solution, and that's what we're measuring for the pH. Now, I've mentioned equivalence and half equivalence. The equivalence point is occurring right about halfway where this spikes up. So close to what this value is here. <coughs> now, technically, for this, because it's a strong acid, strong base reaction, the equivalence point will be occurring right here.
That's because at the equivalence point, that's where the amount of acid and amount of base that we are adding are equal. And if I have equal amounts of strong acid and strong base, what's the pH of my solution supposed to be? And that's why it's at seven. The half equivalence is one half of that volume. So if this is taking 17 milliliters, then half of that's eight and a half. This is my one half equivalence point. Now for a strong acid, strong base reaction, there's nothing overly special about this. With weak acids and weak bases, that is special. We'll see why here, okay? As we get closer to the equivalence point, so this graph, this, this right here is representing, we've added uh, about a little over 16 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. And you'll see here that our pH is starting to rise quickly because we still have the hydrochloric acid being the excess. But now the amount of excess hydrochloric acid that's left over is reduced significantly, which means our pH has to start spiking up. And in this case, we just have a little bit of hydronium left. Most of it's going to be a salt water solution. At equivalence, at a pH of 7, we don't have any hydronium and hydroxides. It's all turned to water. Now, this may seem a little misleading because we can measure the pH, but when you're drawing these if you're drawing out a representation, you're trying to represent the major species in solution. And you are going to have plenty of chloride ions and sodium ions because their molarities are going to be, you know, depending on what, well, this start off in pH of 1. That means the concentration of the uh, strong acid was what? I'm sorry, pH of 1. The con yeah, the concentration of strong acid was what? pH of 1. pH is a negative log, right? And the concentration? 0. 10 raised to what power would give you a pH of 1? 0. Negative 1. Negative 1. 10 to the negative first, which is 0. 0.1. So the concentration of this, if it was a concentration of 1, that would be a pH of 0. Okay, because 10 raised to the 0 is 1. So what we're saying in here is that these chloride ions, or the chloride ions, are representing a 0.1 molar concentration. What's the concentration of the hydronium in pure water? Is that anywhere close to being 0.1? So we don't write it out. We don't represent it. It's not large enough in quantity. Same thing for the hydroxide. It's also going to be 1 times 10 to the negative 7 because it's a neutral solution. If we continue to add strong base, now the, the base is the excess. And we see we get continue spike up there to high pH because now we have hydroxides left over because the hydroxide is the excess reactant. We've used up all of the acid. Basically now, we're just simply adding hydroxide ions to water, a salt water solution. If we continue to add the strong base, I think the next slide. Nope. That's it. If we continue to add the base, you can see that the pH kind of you know levels, it's not leveling out. It doesn't increase nearly as sharply because 
We're just adding more base to more base. In strong acids, strong base titrations, really the only important part of that titration curve that you use to interpret is where does that equivalence point occur? And in a strong acid, strong base titration, that equivalence point will always be at seven. Because if the definition of equivalence is the moles of the acid and moles of base are equal, if you have a strong acid and strong base, they're going to be neutralizing each other. You're not going to have one being in excess over the other, pH of seven. Who's got questions? That's what we're going to get to. Okay. Any questions? <clears throat> now. With a weak acid strong base titration, this is what you did. And I don't know that this graph here represents the same acid that you guys did. I don't think it does. But in this, this is representing a 0.1 molar solution, just like we have with the strong acid. But whereas a strong acid with a 0.1 concentration starting with a pH of 1, this weak acid with a concentration of 0.1 is not because it's not going to dissociate 100%. We know it's an acid because the solution's pH is starting at a pH just below 4 in this graph. Everybody all right that? Now, if we were to represent this graphically, you know, in a drawing, and I'm pretty sure you guys, does yours have the letters already in there? Okay, so in this, unlike the previous one, we don't have a whole lot of hydronium. Yeah? why I'm recording this. Anybody else in anatomy, physiology? I know I'm going to have more next year. So, because we don't have very much of this dissociating, you know, if we have a K value of 10 to the negative fourth or fifth, we're going to have very, very little of that dissociating. So if this is 0.1 molar acid, and its K value is really small, we're not going to have very much of the acid dissociate or react with water, however you want to think about it. Our solution is mostly going to be weak acid. With some hydronium and some conjugate base present. Got questions? As we add strong base, we increase the or we increase the pH because our strong base is going to react with some of the weak acid. What don't we see here? And why? What do we have excess of? Hydronium. Yeah, hydronium. You said hydronium. I heard hydroxide. It took me a second to register. <laughs> so we still have acid for the hydroxide ions to react with. 
Our hydroxide is a limiting reactant so far. Now what we do see is that we now have more of our conjugate base. Not because our acid is dissociating more, it's because our strong base reacted with the weak acid to produce them. Our reaction that's taking place at the beginning and now is our weak acid reacting with water in an equilibrium to produce hydronium and hydro <coughs> the conjugate base. The reaction when we add the base is the, the weak acid is going to react with the hydroxide to produce water and our conjugate base. This re reaction right here is our source of our conjugate base. So as this titration is taking place, the amount of acid is decreasing and the amount of conjugate base is increasing. Once we get into this area here, what kind of solution do we have? What do we have in our solution? We got base, the conjugate base. We also have the conjugate acid. And if you have a solution of conjugate acid with its conjugate base, we call it a water. And what happens when you have a buffer? pH doesn't stay the same, but the pH change, it resists the change in pH. Okay? We've got to be careful about that definition. There are some videos and stuff, there's some resources out there on the internet will say buffer doesn't, it, it keeps the pH from changing. No. The pH will change, it's going, the buffer will limit how much it changes. So, <coughs> this is where in your graphs, You've got a gradual increase in the pH, unlike what it was with the strong. With the strong, it stayed pretty level here, right? And it wasn't until the very end, it wasn't until it got to the, uh, close to the equivalence point that things started to rise sharply. Here we have a gradual change in our pH with the addition of the strong base. What's that? Oh, we're just oh. Did you add? A, uh, where's the hole? Like, Horizontal or vertical? Okay. Now. Can somebody tell me on this graph where the equivalence point is? I have a question. Go ahead. So if there was a better buffer, like if there was a better buffer, would like the, the would it be like a longer graph kind of like it just be more? So it depends. So the the buffer capacity, how well does that buffer work against resisting the change in pH? It depends on two things. What's your ratio? of acid to base, weak acid to weak base, and how much do you have? What are their concentrations? So the concentration of the acid that you use was really pretty low. So we're saying that we're getting a change in pH that would be a little bit more drastic with the addition of the base than if we had a higher concentration. So if I had you use more acid, obviously two things are going to happen. It would take more base to get to the equivalence, but what you would see is you see this area probably a little more flat. Okay? And longer because it's going to take more to get to that. Can somebody tell me where the equivalence point is? Um, at the pH of seven. No. Now, so. <coughs> pH of 7 is at the equivalence point for strong acid and strong base. 
Okay. Nick? This one looks more like eight or nine. Maybe more nine. Around here? Yeah. Yes. So the equivalence point is going to be occurring halfway between where it starts to shoot up and stop shooting up. Okay? So our equivalence point is somewhere around in this area here. In my data, I don't have a point that gets to that. But here's the thing. Even though I don't have a specific point that hits the equivalence point perfectly, if I call that right there my equivalence point, I can make a pretty good approximation as to what the volume is. Again, because we're using narrow, very small volume changes around where that equivalence point is going to occur. Now, based on this, <coughs> this is a little bit about eight milliliters. My one half equivalence point then would occur where? Four point something or another. About here. Oh, look, I've got a data point really close to that. Okay. So, half equivalence. And I've already told you that this is a special case, right? This is a special thing you need to know about. Because if you know the half equivalence point, what do you know? The equivalence point. You know the Ka based on what? The pH. At the one half equivalence point, the pH and the pKa are value or are equal. I know I've said it once. I'm going to say it again. I would strongly encourage you to write it down because if you don't recognize the half equivalence point, it's going to make a world of hurt for you. That one half equivalence. Now I want you to pay attention to the numbers. How many? conjugate bases do I have in my beaker? Five. How many weak acids do I have in my beaker? Four, five. Five. Got five. If you are drawing a representation of the one half equivalence point, you darn well better have the conjugate base and the acid equal in the amount you draw. How many NAS do I have? How many sodium ions? Four. 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 I should probably draw a fifth. I'm not overly concerned about those though. Five. Do I have five? It looks like it's at page five. Yeah, but the number of sodium should be about the same as the A minus. I probably need I need to add one. But again, what they're going to look for is the one half equivalence point is not the sodium ion. It's what is your conjugate acid base pair? How do they number wise relate to each other? And at the one half equivalence point, your weak base and weak acid conjugates are equal in their concentration. They're equal in their number of moles. The pH is equal to the pKa value. Now the H3O, that's going to be dependent upon whatever the pH is, okay? It's still going to be a minor contributor, but the key is, is our conjugate acid and base are going to be equal, okay? Dylan? So the half equivalence point is when the um, when half of the acid is equal to the conjugate base? I'm going to revise what you said. 
when one half of the acid has been used and the acid and conjugate are now even. Okay, then what is the actual equivalence point? So the equivalence point is when you have used up all of the acid. So the amount of base, in this case a strong base sodium hydroxide, that you will add is equal to the number of moles. The moles of base are going to be equal to the moles of the acid. I can't say volumes are going to be equal because they may have different molarities. But the moles of base and moles of acid are equal. And at the equivalence point, you're going to have very little base. I'm sorry, very little acid left over. I can't say zero because we have an equilibrium that we're going to have at that point. Okay? Now, we're still in this, what we call buffer zone, because we still are resisting that change in pH because we have both the acid and its conjugate. But we can say that the resistance to that change in pH is gonna be best in this area because that's where they're close to being equal. Questions? Raver? So at the equivalent, you kind of look at the basically, like how much acid you like, lost is the amount of base you will have. And have used because they got to be equal. Just got questions? Okay. So our next step is the equivalence point. At the equivalence point, the amount of strong base is equal to the amount of weak acid that you use in the titration. And based on my answer I gave to Dylan, I can't say that you have zero of the, con or of the acid. It seems like you should because we just added strong base to react with the weak acid. Which means we pretty much now only have this as our primary thing in solution. But that's a what? It's a base. It's a weak base in water. And that weak base is going to react with water in an equilibrium to do what? Give you the conjugate acid and OH minus. This class is why the pH is above 7. So in a titration between a weak acid and a strong base, the equivalence point will occur at a pH above 7. That's where you got to interpret the graph, okay? Where that pH occurs is going to depend on how strong is the base. The stronger the base, the closer to 7 the equivalence would be, okay? Now, again, pH is above 7 because that weak base is going to produce hydroxide ions and that means it's a basic solution. But we also have some of this compound because it's an equilibrium. Even though, so this acid is the result of this equilibrium. Kind of don't think of it as like that's acid left over. It's not acid left over. At the equivalence point, we use up all of our weak acid. It's the reaction of the weak base with water that's making some of it back. How come that equation right there from the bottom equation you wrote there is the same equation, but that one's an equilibrium and that one's not? 
So this is when we have our weak acid and we've got this hydroxide being added to the HA solution. So this hydroxide, this is coming from the sodium hydroxide being added. Okay, this hydroxide is the hydroxide produced when our weak base reacts with water. That's an equal, this is an equilibrium, that is not. Does that help? Who else has questions? If we continue on with the titration then, We no longer have any weak bait, I'm sorry, weak acid for the base to react with, so the pH continues to rise sharply. And now the pH is being determined by primarily the hydroxide that we add, excess, and the weak base that's in the solution is contributing a little bit. Primarily, though, the pH of this solution now is driven by that hydroxide that we added. <clears throat> Who's got questions? <clears throat> Nick, can you reconnect? Yeah. Please? This equation here is valid as long as we have our acid at the end of any kind at the end of the reaction after we added strong base. As long as we have this, this is going to be an equilibrium. This is the reaction we would use to do any calculation <coughs> for when we add the hydroxide. Okay? Prior to equivalence point. This would be in excess, this would be limited. At equivalence, these would both be equal in their number of moles. After equivalence, this would be the limiting, this would be the excess. Okay. Um, select the graph. Move it over to the side here. Can you make it can you make it wider? Not taller but wider? Okay. That's good. Okay. Now this is not ideal, but I'm I'm okay with that. I'm sh I'm sure most of yours look similar to this. Okay. Now, the problem with this graph is because is that I would like more I would like more lines vertically so we can make interpret these better. Okay? But we'll make do. So on this graph, our equivalence point and that is, is going to be right here, okay? Somewhere in this area right there. Then, when we read the equivalence point, we're looking for a volume. So what volume of base did we need to use up 
the acid that we had in the solution. So we'll call it 38. And if you look in that data there, if you go to the data table itself, I'm not telling you to, but if you were to go to the data table, you'd probably see some data there that tells you more specifically what that is, okay? Again, it's why I wish we had a better grid on this. I don't know how to do it on sheets quickly. Otherwise, I'd tell you. But if this is, if we're calling this 38 milliliters, half of 38 is 19. That would be our one half equivalence. So this is our equivalence point. <laughs> then the one half equivalence is going to be 19 milliliters. Call it there. And it looks like you've got a data point there. If it's not right on, <coughs> right? No, don't. Do you have do you have the table pulled up? Yeah. But it looks like whatever Nick did to it, it did to yours too, didn't it? Yeah. It did. Okay. Nick, move that off to the side so we can see where the 19 milliliter mark is or what the pH is. Uh, it's 7.2. 7 Okay. Now, again, we're making some rough estimates on this because we don't have, you know, the grid could be a little bit better, but if we're saying that with Nick's data, if we're saying that the equivalence point is at the 38 millimeter, milliliter mark, then the one half equivalence is going to be at the 19 milliliter mark, and that's 7.24. 7.24. That's also the what then? PKA. The Not the KA, but the PKA. So the main reason we're going to put one to find the one half equivalence? Correct. How would you like finding the equivalence? The pH at the equivalence point, how would you calculate it? We're going to go over that. Hang on to that question. Now, so one of the goals here for us is to identify what the acid is that we used. Now, the second lab that you did, we calculated the equivalent mass, correct? Figure out how many moles of acid did you use? I'm sorry, how many moles of base did you use? How many moles of acid? Grams of acid? We can do that same thing now. Nick, Dylan, either one of you. How many grams of, eight of the acid did you use? Or like which one? We only did one trial. Yes. Yeah. So it's the difference between the dish and the dish plus the acid. So there are 6189 grams. Okay. How many mil so we're kind of, we're calling it 38 milliliters. Everybody follow along with this with your data. So we're calling this 38 milliliters, right? Yeah. What was the molarity of your base?
from the very first lab set we did. You get the average. Uh, 0.171. So take 38 times 0.171 divided by a thousand. Now, from the second lab that we did, do you remember what the, the average mass was that you got from that? 94.6. No, that's from all that. Correct. Okay, so from lab number two, where you did the equivalent mass and found your average. This is Nick and Dylan's average. In this is lab number three, which is pretty darn close still, right? And we determined that the PK value is 7.24. Going to drive. Where's my Google Drive? Now, Google Drive, <coughs> I have a document there titled EMKA PKA values for acids. Don't take that off, Nick. Or don't disconnect. Please. Now, some people are closer than others. As a class, your average values were a tad low compared to my period four class. Period seven, theirs was pretty spread out. Okay? Now, if we look at both, the equivalent mass and the PK value, what would be the best candidate from this list for the acid that you guys use? So sodium hydrogen sulfate This one? Yeah. Or this one? Sulfite. So, so Sulfite? So yeah. Yes. You said sulfate, oh, I meant sulfate, which is one right above it. That's why I, I, that's why I want to make sure. So based on that data, this matches up pretty well. Wasn't our data closer of a Ka times ten to the negative ten? I don't know. I'm saying not ten to the negative ten. The P because the PK value that Nick had was at the half equivalence was 7.2. Okay. Now I think did anybody here get 100, 102 for their average mass in the second lab? 
Did you guys all had yours in the 90s? Yes. That's what I thought. That's why I said yours was a little low. In my period four class, I had, I had most of the groups getting around 100 to 102 grams for their molar mass. And it was real. So, using both that information, the K value that you, the PK value you get at the one half equivalence point, as well as the equivalent mass, this is the, really the only one that makes sense. Yes, I know they're not the same values. This is reference values. Okay. I saw you guys using the balances. I saw you guys using the burettes. You're terrible at it. You're lazy. <laughs> Can't be lazy about though. Even with your laziness and sloppiness in a lab, you're getting pretty darn close values, right? On what? Oh, okay. <laughs> now, you guys had the issue. At, wait a minute. Who's worked at station two in here? Because you guys are station one, right? I did, but I didn't. So. I think I know why yours was screwed up. Why? What's it station two? The what? It was station two. Why? Why? That's good enough. Because the soap bottle had water filled in. <gasps> no, I rewatched it. I emptied it out. I just filled it back up. Because I wanted to be able to do it. Yeah. I told you guys were a little That's probably made a difference. You had soap in your face. I know. Well, soap is still made of soap. Soap is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, that made a difference. I made soap. Okay, hey, wait a minute. Here, here's, here's, here's the reason why. One of the properties of bases is they feel slippery. So for all of you idiots out there that was handling the sodium hydroxide when I yelled at you to wash your hands, what did it feel like when you went to go wash your hands? It was really slippery. Bases are slippery. So soap, detergents, those are slippery because they're basic. Oil is, that's different. Why is just how it works. <laughs> okay. Now, <coughs> oh. I need to check something here real quick. Uh, turned identity. Okay. Points that kind of discussed. Control security discussed. Product. Product. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, the other document that I have. Thank you, Nick. You can disconnect. Disconnect. Yeah, you can disconnect. Now. I'm, I'm done. Okay. Now. So this is the this. This series of slides is the math part of the titrations. That's all right. So if you're doing calculations, so we've already talked about how to do these. If you're adding a strong to a weak, you do stoichiometry and moles first, right? Whatever's left over, that's what you do the calculations for the next part with. In strong acid, strong base titrations, your excess is going to be a <coughs> strong acid or strong base. Find out what the concentration of that is and find the pH or pOH, boom, you're done. You don't have to do any equilibrium. So reaction goes to completion. You do a rice table to determine your limiting reactant. The rice table has to be done in what units? Moles. Excess, remaining amount, determine the pH of the solution. 
titration reaches neutral, pH is 7, when your hydronium and hydroxide are equal. In your weak, strong titrations, reaction goes to completion. You're going to do a rice table in moles again to determine your limiting the excess. If your weak acid or weak base is in excess, you get a new equilibrium to determine your hydronium or hydroxide. The pH is not going to be 7 at equivalence. If it is a weak acid with a strong base being added, the pH at equivalence will be where? Over 7. If it is a weak base titrated with a strong acid, the pH will be where? Below 7. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to breeze through this quickly because we've done these calculations. Okay? If you need to go back and review these, I can put, I've got a video that uses these slides and explains it in detail. It's about a 30 minute video. But like I said, we've done these already. Okay? <coughs> so, in this series, and again, I'm not going to go through all these in detail. In this series here of calculations, I start off doing zero milliliters added, so basically just what's the concentration pH of the acid. That right there we did in the previous, before Christmas break. At 12 milliliters of sodium hydroxide added, 16.80 milliliters added. That's the half equivalence point, by the way. 28 milliliters of sodium hydroxide added. 33.6 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. That's the equivalence point. That's why these two match up the way they do. And then this is going to be an excess of sodium hydroxide. Now, so I'm going to I need I'm going to skip quickly through these. You set up your rice table, you set up your equilibrium. This is for when you have nothing, okay? pH, 3.89. Okay, so we add sodium hydroxide. The acid's gonna be in excess. We do a neutralization stoichiometry in moles. We then do a weak acid equilibrium. I will take, make note for this for you. I use the unit of millimoles in this video here. I don't care what version of moles you use. They're done the same way. The reason I use millimoles is be that way you don't have to worry about liters. Everything's done in milliliters. Okay. <clears throat> so you do your you do your reaction in your stoichiometry in moles, you see what's in excess. Once you get what's in excess, you recalculate the molarities. This is a step that people forget. Once you recalculate the molarities, then you're ready to go into the next equilibrium. And you start off with your acid, you start off with your conjugate base, and you can either do that or the Henderson Hasselbach equation. At the half equivalence, I'm going to skip. Okay? The, at the half equivalence, there's nothing special. You're going to do the exact same things. Titration status, excess acid, equivalence. This is what I want to get to. Because, Dylan, you asked about the calculation at the equivalence point. Now I'm going to slow down. Okay? So <clears throat> we've got our neutralization stoichiometry. 
just like we've done. We do it in moles. But at the equivalence point, what's going to be true? Before I put the table up, what's going to be true at equivalence? The number of moles will be the same. So we have the weak acid reacting with the strong base. The moles are the same. This is equivalent. When you, do, when you set up the rice table then, the only thing left at the end is your weak base conjugate. The volume of which is going to be 48.6, because that's going to be the sum of what's the volume of the acid, what's the sum of your base that you used. And let me translate this to what you did in the lab. How many milliliters of acid did you make? I had to measure it out. How many milliliters of acid did you make? No, no, in the last lab, you, when you mix the acid. 50. No. 100. 100 milliliters, because I had to measure it out on 100 milliliters graduated cylinder, correct? Now, with Nick and Dylan, at their equivalence point, what volume would, be, would we be using to calculate the new molarity? Well, they use. 38 milliliters of base. What did they add that to? 100 milliliters of acid. 100 milliliters of acid. So the total volume would be? 138. Again, don't forget in doing these calculations here that you've got to do a, a, find the total volume of all the solutions that are mixed together. Now, this is where things look different. Because we only have the weak base at the end of this reaction at equivalence, we can't do an equilibrium with the acid. We don't have any of the weak acid. Our equilibrium must be done with the base. Now, up to this point in time, all the calculations would have been using the Ka for the acid. We need a KB. How do I find it? It's not boating well. How do you find the KB? No. Close. You could use something like that. You could do 14 equals PKA plus PKB. Or KW equals KA times KB. <clears throat> so KB equals KW divided by KA. You find your new KB value because you have to have the because we're doing it as a base. You set up and do your equilibrium, <coughs> and the <coughs> pH of this would have been 10.38. Now, something to keep in mind. In setting up this equation right here, this X is hydroxide. So X is equal to hydroxide. Negative log of that is going to be 3.62. That's the pOH. Change it to the pH because that's what we're looking for. This is at equivalence. Does this make sense? What's the pH of a solution? of a weak acid with a strong base at equivalence have to be more than seven. This pH is about seven. The only thing different about these calculations, and it, I think you might have done one in the owls already, 
is that you have to do the volume. A lot of the questions in the owls simply told you how many moles of acid or moles of base you added. They didn't tell you what the molarity and volume were. Okay? With excess base, so the same basic thing is going to take place. Except now we have more base than we have the weak acid. At the end of that reaction, we are going to have hydroxide and weak base. If we go through and do the <coughs> convert back into molarities, and then go set up our rice table with the weak base, A shortcut to this. Somebody take the negative log of point zero zero seven. Two point one five. Class, look it up here. The pH of this solution, you could go through and do this calculation, but the pH is pretty much going to be determined by this. Once you get your hydroxide as the excess, because it's strong, it's going to be pretty much determining the pH of the solution. The weak base is not going to be contributing much at all. Like I said, I could go through this quickly because you've done these calculations before. We've talked about them. The only difference between what, we, what this is describing and what you have done is that most of the problems that you've done, we only did moles of acid or base added to the wheat, not the volume and molarity. Okay. You think your parents have your lives planned out for you. I have your life planned out for you. Oh, no. What's that? All I do when I get home is Okay. So. Because I've got January, February, and March on there. Did you account for the day that we aren't going to be here? The SAT only day? Yeah. What? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. So, we are right here. Lab wrap up discussion pH curves. Friday. For you guys, unit wrap up. Tuesday, your test. I will be getting, what's that? Oh. I will be getting the uh, um, AP classroom stuff that's relevant to this material up. Uh, there's also some practice problems that I can get up for this, but um, chapter f it's chapter 15, if I'm not mistaken. And you know what we've been doing with these calculations with Henderson Hasselbach buffers and these titrations, that's it. Now, do you have to understand the stuff that we did prior to winter break? Yeah. I mean, that, that's kind of the foundation for this stuff. 
Are you going to have to go through and do a bunch of titration calculations that take half an hour? No. Are you going to have to do parts of those or a calculation involve all those? Yeah, you're going to have to do one or parts of one or understand what to do. You're going to have to understand how to interpret the pH curves. Identify, is it a strong acid, strong base? Is it a weak acid, strong base? Is it a strong base, weak acid titration? Okay. That next unit, then we start on that Thursday, Wednesday. Okay, sorry. That, yeah, Thursday the 27th. Your exam, Happy Valentine's Day, is going to be on Valentine's Day for the next unit after that. The owls are up and ready for you guys to go for the next unit.